Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. This is uh, the final session of the Fort Collins Book Fest. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled that the festival is being closed out with these two wonderful poets. Um, my name's Hermione Hobie. I am the author of two novels, um, Neon in Daylight and Virtue, which was published in July. Um, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm so thrilled um, to be talking to these two wonderful women. Um, both from New Mexico and both uh, with collections of poems that really speak to each other in ways that I'm very excited to, to talk about. Um, so to let you know how, how this hour will go, um, both Kais and Michelle will read from their work and then we will move into a discussion. Um, and we will then, in the last section um, of our time, open it up to questions. So I say that now so you can start getting your questions ready, which you should uh, type in the comments. Um, we welcome your questions. Um, so before we get started, I just want to acknowledge a few of the festival sponsors. Um, the Book Fest is produced by Poudre River Public Library District. And our presenting sponsors are the City of Fort Collins Fort Fund and Colorado State, Li Colorado State University Libraries. Um, further support has been provided by organizations including Poudre River Friends of the Library, Front Range Community College, Liggett, Johnson and Goodman, Northern Colorado Writers. So thank you to all of them and to our media partners KUNC and 105.5 The Colorado Sound. So with our housekeeping out the way, let me introduce these two poets. Michelle served as the Poet Laureate of Albuquerque from 2018 to, to 2020. She is the author of the poetry collection Bosque, which looks like this. Uh, the essay collection, Malinche's Daughter, and the forthcoming Vessels, a memoir of borders. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming on the Modern Love podcast, NPR's Code Switch, and in New Mexico magazine, Shenandoah, and the Best of Brevity Anthology. Michelle is also the founder of Arte Sana Creative Consulting, which is rooted in the belief that art and story heal which is something I think we'll be talking about later um, with, with Kais as well. As a writer, community-based artist and coach, she uses creative expression and storytelling as the basis for positive social change. Welcome, Michelle. If we were in a real room, there would probably be applause right now. <laughs> uh, Kais is the author of the collection Refugia, which I have here which won the Test Site Poetry Prize and received a 2020 New Mexico, Arizona Book Award. Her poems have appeared in Kenyan Review, Boston Review, Sycamore Review, Quarterly West and QWERTY, among other places. She holds an MFA in poetry from the Institute of American Indian Arts and lives in Santa Fe. And what I don't have on this official bio, but I just want to mention is that Kais is a trained herbalist, is that right? Awesome. Welcome, Kais. I'm so happy to have you both. Um, so we will hear, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we will hear first from Michelle and then Kais. And then, um, as I said, we will uh, discuss and then open it up to the audience. Um, so Michelle, can I, can I pass things over to you? We're eager to hear from you. Yes, thank you. Um, so just happy to be here with you all. And um, hopefully next year, it'll be in person. And uh, so thanks, Hermione, for bringing us together and um, to all the folks at the at the book festival. Um, so I'm just I'm going to read um, exclusively from the collection Bosque, and you can see my cheat sheet here. <laughs> so um, I'll start with a few poems that were rooted in my Poet Laureate project. Um, I hosted a monthly series of walks through the Rio Grande Bosque. Um, and I did every month I'd invite a local poet to um, pick a spot in the bosque that they liked, um, to pick a poet whose work they wanted to celebrate. And then we would take a walk. And um, except for one month when the mosquitoes were really bad, <laughs> we would stop along the way and read poetry and write poetry. So um, much of this book is inspired by, by that experience. Um, seed packet for dry land. Wrap in old rags, plant after last freeze, shoulder deep in dark soil. Drop water to survive dry times. How to measure sunlight, 
how to thrive when late rain, no rain, elk raid, frost. You know this. Everything breaks to become what it is. You know this. It is all dry land. When time comes, winnow, grind into coarse flour, take to river where we are enough. Um, there's a lot about rain and about water um, because we are in a desert, so every drop is precious. And, um, and I've always had a consciousness around that, so it shows up a lot in my work. Um, so this next one is simply called Rain. We remember Isleta feast day, hide drum, dancers pray with their feet, one chin then another turns to sky. Two gold eagles circle conjuring clouds, one drop then another, stillness except the drum, the dance, the rain. Sunday morning, we cross Central Bridge on foot, called by the same spirit drawing hiking boots, cowboy hats, hard creased dickies, running shorts, pigtails, plastic rosary hanging from a walker, nose rings, Oakland Raiders tattoos. We stand in silence on the banks of the Rio Grande, pilgrims, no less awestruck than John the Baptist converts for the miracle of a river at its highest point in 40 years. For a moment, we forget our thirst. Um, another bosque walk. Bosque walk, Groundhog Day. Olive tree feeds cedar waxwing. Groundhog sees early spring, 60 degrees in February. In photograph, nephew holds utility knife. In Facebook post, he asks, neck or wrist. I look at everything like it's going to die. How much longer, waxwing, groundhog, nephew, how much longer? Do you think you're the only one? How much longer, olive, bosque, woman wearing my skin these 48 years? Bosque, like poetry says, pay attention. Woodpecker taps a trunk, pillbug turns leaf to lace. Um, let's see. And I know you're all, um, you know, we're all on a webinar or live streaming. We can't see, we can't see you, <laughs> but I know you're there. So let's just all take a deep breath together. <laughs> just, <laughs> so I know, you know, we're, we're together, even though we're alone. Um, so, you know, as poet laureate, you get invited to write poems for many different occasions. And so, um, so that's why in, you know, there's a poem in here that's about nanotechnology and CRISPR, <laughs> which I don't think I would have written um, had it not been for um, a research award for, for folks at UNM using the libraries. Um, this particular one was commissioned by, um, um, by New Mexico Voices for Children. Um, for their annual conference, their Kids Count Conference. And I thought about what do children need when they're growing up um, and what specifically can this place give them? Um, so to grow a child in New Mexico. You were born a cottonwood spore in drought. You were born in monsoon. You were born in a season of fire. You were born flor de tuna rodeada de espinas. You were born head first in the center of the earth. You learned to crawl among mother roots, learned mother tongues. You fed on stories and flower tortillas, suckled caldo from grandmother's fingertips. You were raised by many mothers, by a tole in a tin cup, by the light of a south facing wall. You forgot your language, the road washed out behind you. You fought a war nobody knows. You came home, you never left. You were yerba buena, you were yerba del manso. You were passion flower named for Christ. What does it take to grow a child? More sunlight, water, well-drained soil. What if butterflies, guitarra y acordeon? What if bosque, if dicho y hecho, if paintbrush, if pluma? We pray for you with our hands, fashion a vessel of mud, of bone. Hearing is the last sense to leave the body. We work to give you enough to speak to us, enough to sing. Um, 
there was a time in my life when I really felt like I had two homes and I still feel like that in a lot of ways. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be able to spend some time in Oaxaca, Mexico in, uh, from 2004 to 2006. I went for nine months. I stayed for two years. And um, this poem was inspired by, um, well, you'll hear it in the poem, actually. There was um, a teacher strike every year. And in 2006, that teacher strike was violently struck down by um, the state government. And so um, this kicks this poem kicks off the morning of that. And um, I'll probably close with this one. Um, Mestenio, after Luis Jimenez. Helicopter blades drown the swish swish of Barrendero's sweeping night from Oaxaca streets. Eyes watered, silly me. It wasn't the duffel half pack next to the bed, the tick tock tick of my travel clock. I was leaving the place that told me I'm beautiful, leaving a lover, 19 years older, a gift. He was a marine biologist, my own Jacques Cousteau. Our phones buzzed and beeped instead of copal, tear gas, instead of atole woman, police. Before dawn in riot gear with rubber bullets and clubs, they'd storm the Socalo where striking teachers slept on ground under tents and tarps. Antes de Mexico, I was a plain girl following my brother's band to a jazz festival in the Sacramento mountains. Luis Jimenez and his wife shared my table, gave me their address in Hondo, said, stop by any time. I didn't know he was a famous artist. I walked the Socalo with Cousteau, Cafe doors shuttered, embers, fragments, cardboard, crate, baby bottle, belt, ladder, stake, stool, sting. No shoe shine boys, no globeros, no accordeon, ni marimba, no fruit fenders. Hasta las gitanas perched on gazebo steps who grabbed tourist hands to tell their fortunes. Gone. I emailed my parents, told them not to worry. It turns out no one was looking for me. Inbox, a headline, Chicano artist Luis Jimenez dies. A section of his sculpture fell, pinned him to the floor, severed his femoral artery. I loved my lover's color, flor de maíz, the salted caramel of his voice, the rope of his muscles against my hands, the way he touched my face with the backs of his fingers that first time he asked, ¿Quieres ir a casa conmigo? By now, Luis Jimenez was famous to me too. El Buen Pastor, Alligators in San Jacinto Plaza, El Vaquero, UNM, Fiesta Dancers. He made us big, garish, outlandish. I never stopped for that visit. I held back, didn't believe his generosity. What would I have said to him? Fui a casa con Jacques Cousteau. He said there was a woman in Mexico City and was that okay? Would I still have him? Está bien. And anyway, I'm leaving. After the Socalo, the email, Luis Jimenez dead the way my grandmother was dead, the way Gloria Saldua was dead, back in his bedroom, watercolor set on the bottom shelf of his nightstand. ¿También pintas? No, son de ella. ¿Quién es ella? La novia. ¿La novia de quién? Mi novia. Taxi back to my place, duffel on the seat next to me, empty streets. The artist's children and apprentices completed the sculpture, delivered to Denver airport, lonely on what was prairie, and Mesteño rears up, front hooves raised against sunset, red neon eyes, untamed. Que bueno que no sabía. I didn't want to fight. I took him as he was, older, divorced, spoken for, living in his brother's spare room. I left before it got bad. How I leave everything. Barricades, piles of trash, Graffiti, tourists, Oaxaca is temporarily closed, will open when there is justice. I miss that girl sometimes. Buses burned, a helicopter carrying the governor crashed. He survived. How quickly a place, a life can change. Here, then not. Blank wall, then graffiti, lover's bed to backseat of my parents' SUV. Beautiful then and there to what I am here. That girl knew how to do for herself. She borrowed something simpler about that than keeping for herself. And for Luis Jimenez, I learned a lesson, something about being too big, about how your own creation can kill you, make you bleed. Thank you. Michelle, thank you so much. <laughs> Imagine the applause that is no doubt happening, even if it's internal with all these strangers we can't see. It was wonderful to hear you read those. I And it was wonderful to hear that last one because um, Denver Airport is just down the road from me. So that sculpture is familiar. So there was a wonderful sense of recognition and to, to learn a little more about it. So thank you. 
I so often have a sense of um, the devotional in your poems. And I wonder, you know, hearing you mention the Bosque walks in which both the inspiration for the poems and an experience of that landscape are, are brought together. Um, I just, I wonder if you see both writing poems about the landscape and being in the landscape in particular, paying attention, which I'm sort of um, paraphrasing a line from the poem, whether those things to you are a form of prayer or a, you know, an act of worship or a, just how devotion is, is working for you and in these poems. Mm. Um, thank you for that question. I, um, I think I, I grew up Catholic. I haven't been to mass and I, I think I know a lot of Catholics who say this. I haven't been to mass in so long and we immediately feel guilty. <laughs> so that's part that's of it. always more Catholic than going to mass. I'm <laughs> yeah. guilty about not going Yeah, to all the guilt. <laughs> um, but I think because of that, there is a part of me that really responds like to ritual and mm -hmm. um, to the idea of sanctuary and, um, and I feel both of those things um, in the bosque. Uh, so mm. especially this time of year, there's something really gorgeous about the light, the smell of it. And then mm. um, also I think the sense of, um, the sense of peril. Um, and I, I think that's my next, um, that's the next thing I explore when, when I get this memoir out of me <laughs> completely. I'm really interested in this idea of peril, of how um, that place like holds, um, just like so much hope for me and it's very restorative. And then there's a part of it that really breaks my heart. And it's um, just looking at how dry it is right now or how little water is in the river. And, um, and then I think about how that relates to um, just the feminine or the sense of like earth as mother and, um, and how we protect um, women and, and young women um, in, in different places, like particularly along the border where, where I was raised and, and in places where I've lived. Um, so for me, it's, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, definitely spiritual. It's my, it's how I experienced the, one of the ways that I experienced the sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it had, seems to have that same quality to it as when I was a, a kid and would think about like, you know, what it meant to, um, there's a lot of talk of like, like paradise or heaven and hell or yeah. purgatory and, and how, how that really plays mm -hmm. out, how I feel it plays out here on earth. And it's, and it's about separation, right? Like yeah. the hell is, is, is like distance or a lack of connection. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the places I go when I'm, um, when I'm too in my head or when I'm disconnected from myself or when I'm blocked and um, and thank God we we have access to it here, especially in the the, the height of the pandemic. I, I I don't know what I would have done <laughs> without the bosque or the ditches. Yeah. yeah, well, not bosque for me, but yes, nature. Yes, you you use the words sanctuary and peril and kais. I think that dyad <laughs> really speaks to refugia. Um, so. Uh, but that's my introduction <laughs> to um, to asking you if you might read for us a little, and then we will all talk more after that. Thank you, Hermione, for hosting us and holding us in this reading and conversation. And to our um, hosts at the book festival, especially Meg, and thank you, Michelle. That was such a beautiful reading. It was so transporting. I'm so grateful. And I want to get in my car and drive to the Bosque for sunset because I can imagine the, is it as golden yet as it could yes. be? That's <laughs> what I'm imagining. And I just want to go and soak in that light. Like that is such a, a needed ritual for me to bring in all the light from the, from the land as we go into the dark times. I'm going to read a few poems from my book, Refugia, and if I have time, a couple of new poems. Let's see, three, four, five. Dear future child, the winter the oil dipped in the barrels and the desert was gridded for drills and all the new wars began. It was like every other, except we learned to sing harmonies as the children slept. And now and then rain clattered the roof. He found the notes we needed. I held the melody lightly between my lips, lightly as they say to do with questions and other things that waver in our hands. 
On nights we didn't take down our instruments, I wrote a book of letters. Each one began, dear future child. The letters always end with a bouquet of purple asters that wilt before I can weave them into crowns. I drive to the market for more flowers, wishing that driving were already banned. And remember that at night when we sing, the moment our voices separate is the moment they become beautiful. Rinconada. The orchard is a ramshackle basket of small feasts gleaned from bent branches. The untended earth littered in apples as if our origins had been scattered and left to seed. Perched on ladders, our children have round cheeks, wisps of hair glowing as the leaves do with slanted equinox light. They reach for peaches, small ones hung like tiny suns they can taste. I would take any wreck along this river and hang my lace in the windows while the last of the fruit, dark maroon and glowing, spoils with sweetness. Somewhere in my recipe box is the one that returns me to my bearings. I can't find it, but I just remembered that to make the best applesauce, all you need are the best apples. When was the last time you left something to cook in its own ravening juices? Crossing Elwood Pass. I'm sure for many in Colorado, you're familiar with the site of the forests that are disappearing and my many of the poems in this book are really uh, reckoning with that loss as Michelle was saying the grief of losing the places we love crossing Elwood Pass little road in the San Juans we travel dirt roads that exhaust us with die-off every conifer between Platoro and South Fork shaggy limbed and gray, snags mapping the mountain's black lung. The girls murmur in the back seat, sketching tiny figures that they arrange into families with torn edges and lives narrated fluently in verbs. Hear how they bound, how they comfort, how they cry. We take oxygen for granted along the creek where we lay a blanket in bread and bruise the scent from yarrow with bare feet. We heard a child was lost that day in the San Juans and crossed Elwood Pass not knowing his fate. No sign of search crews, but that's just it. No sign, save 40 washboard miles of the forest beckoning its retreat. At Timberline, we crouch beneath dead trees to snip arnica blooms. The yellow sprawl of petals caught in long shafts of unhampered and unblocked light. Refugia 4. I have a sequence of poems that runs through here called Refugia. I think you should Google that term <laughs> or get the book and read a little bit more to learn because I just don't have enough time. But it's about um, refugium, refugia are places where species can survive climatic shifts and it's a source of hope and some restoration for me in this time. Refugia for Overwintering theories abound with lessons I will apply to taming my petulance. Still, I burn when crossed. During the last glacial fireweed went in pursuit of soil, long leaves ragged along the same crags they have rambled over for epics. Paleopollen indicate shore pines walking away from ice. And though I fret over the fate of fur and pignon, 
The biologist with a baby at her breast says these mountains were not long ago populated by different trees altogether. She says grief is losing what we know of home while the land drifts into a thousand small harbors and leaves us to our short lives, our quick tempers. Okay, time is running. I'm gonna go to one of my newer poems because they're so intense and sad. I just can't end on those notes. But um, let's go to this one. It's called Blood City. The city of blood has fallen asleep. Elsewhere, children play tag on bones. Women jog over bones, but no one knows it's bones underfoot. They fill grocery carts and get drive through coffee as if the grass skinned ground they stand upon never buried a past, let alone a people. I lived in those places once, but came home. Here, watchmen peer from towers, their eyes set on the red horizon. We have what other places call history, but we call bodies. Pinon skeletons scarecrow the foothills. Trash bleeds out of arroyo banks. The stones on the trail are really snakes, coiled stiff as fossils. They're not dead, but dormant. The stones underfoot are eggs strong as marble. What do snakes have to do with bones? Better to ask what these bones will hatch, what lies curled inside the shell of the dead. Thank you for going there with me. And I will close with um, another apple poem called Origin of the Apple. We'll revisit the dead there in a different way. <laughs> There's a botanist, Russian botanist, who went to the origin place of the apple in Almaty in, was it Kazakhstan? Um, and he says, the center of origin is where the greatest diversity occurs. At Almaty, I could see with my own eyes the origin of the apple was Nikolai Babilov. One, every family is a mountain nooked with hollows, variations of trunks twisted and rising on the long slope, bud and bloom, hip and slowly ripened fruit. Deep in crested ridges, the first to become all the rest. Two, if I could trace this body back far enough through teasel beds and clear cut meadows, I would be home, familiar to the people who look up in surprise at the stranger who wears their face, who carried a bucket, it must be milk, across the fields to their table. Three, I am sometimes religious, but I do not know if it is God I believe in or apples, or if there is any difference. I look at this forest, even in its falling, and am brought to my knees. Four, here is origin, fruit on the mountain. Where God created the apple, the apple can be anything. It is what color it chooses, what flavor it wants, Wife to whichever wandering bee with pollen dusted feet it pleases. Every star seeded apple ever set on your plate was born from this place. Five, every thread you unravel from your dress splits in its threshing. Each ancestor whose name you learn is undone before you reach her face. You will never know the feast from which you were born. Thank you. Kais, thank you so much. How beautiful to hear those words in your voice in real time. Um, you, you gave us a wonderful capsule definition of um, refugia um, and reading your work to my mind implicit in the notion of both refugia and just the word refuge 
is a sense of inviolability that such a spot will always be safe. And uh, of course, as you um, indicated, and as Michelle was um, speaking about, uh, th there's a terrible poignancy running through this idea in that ecological disaster has made true refugia uh, even rarer. Um, so reading your poems, I, I mean, you, you sort of said you can't end on that sad note. And mm -hmm. I have a curious sense of consolation reading your work. And I wonder whether you see your poems as, in a sense, refuges in that they do preserve something in an inviolable, indelible way. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of hopelessly romantic about <laughs> literature. And, you know, to me, something that, that's so wonderful about poems is that you can't break them. They set down something. Um, does, does that resonate with you? Does that, um, is that part of your sort of mission as a poet? Mm -hmm. That is so beautiful, Hermione. Um, I've thought of our own selves as refugia, like what are we holding, preserving um, for, for humanity, for culture, for our descendants, you know, the future children, future children. But I had not made that leap into poetry, but given our topic of place and poetry, I feel that it's absolutely true. And the, what it is that can exist there and is sustained in poetry and, and I extend that to art in general. I do feel like all artists are somehow engaged in this process of making a home for the soul, like a place where our depth can survive in frankly a time that is incredibly hostile, not to trees and butterflies and polar bears, but our humanity. As well. to our souls. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you, and, and you're sort of speaking to this question with that answer, but I want to ask you both um, a, a pretty broad question, and then we will perhaps uh, sort of retreat into to more discussion of, of place and loss and so on. Um, but I, I'm curious why for both of you, poetry is your chosen form, um, why it might I don't know, speak, speak to your concerns and to our moment more than anything else for you. Um, Michelle, how about you? Thank you for that. And thank you, Kai. So it was so beautiful to hear your, your work and your, your own voice. Um, so they, thank you for that gift. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it, it's, um, I didn't hear my grandmother's voice just saying like, put attention or like pay, pay attention. Mm. Um, I feel like the literal translation from Spanish is like, pon atención, put attention. Um, and, and I think it is that, that of just, um, it just slows me down. Um, so my, my entry point um, into poetry was the, through prose. I, I really um, am more of an accidental poet. Um, so, and I, I think you'll see that in my poems that it's more, I've, a lot of narrative poems. Um, so I kind of can't get away from storytelling or talking about myself <laughs> in my work, like exploring different things. But I think what I, um, what I find really, um, what I love most about poetry is just that quality of paying attention of just slowing down and, um, and distilling something to its essence. Like what's the most important thing to say about this or what is standing out and kind of stripping away all of the other stuff. And, um, and then I like how, um, I think the other thing that I like is how you can return to a poem over and over. And it has that quality of, um, you know, almost holding like a, a gemstone or a, up to the light and you can see all the fibers and just depending on the quality of the light, you'll get something new out of it each time. Um, so it's, like these lifelong relationships with them, um, with poems I love. Yeah, yeah. Kais, how about you? Mm -hmm. Maybe we've, we've already touched on it, but yeah, mm -hmm. any, any thoughts in terms of that? It's, I think, I mean, I still dabble in prose writing and essays and I do other things to be creative. For me, I mean, what you were asking about the kind of active devotion in the bosque and that for me, there's something about sitting down 
with the poetic imagination that is just a portal that nothing else opens that door for me. And it's the closest I get to other realms, I guess. I mean, that sounds really out there, but you know, you, I just am there and I, it's a collaboration with language as my teacher, Joan Cain used to say. And language is just this incredible, extraordinary gift. Um, it is story, we need stories, but it's also music, it's also image. Um, it's also just the unknown springing into being. And I just am addicted to that feeling of being amazed by what can happen. Well, that shines through in your work, so thank you. <laughs> it will it makes all us addicted as we read it too. Oh, well. um, Thank you also for, for reading The Origin of the Apple, which I should say to our audience was a bit of a last minute request. Uh, guys, well, graciously. I was planning so. to read it. <laughs> okay, great. Good. <laughs> well, I was very happy to hear you read it. Um, uh, so th there are lines in that poem, if I could trace this body back far enough through teasel beds and clear cut meadows, I would be home. And I, these lines chimed with some lines of yours, Michelle, from Aquí Estamos, uh, when you write the ombligo, or is it ombligo? My pronunciation is probably not tip top. Ombligo, ombligo hard G. Yeah. The ombligo will always lead you home. And as I understand it, ombligo is the, the belly button. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So in these in these lines, I had this sense, um, and you know, this is apparent elsewhere in in both of your poems of motherhood, inheritance, uh, continuity, and how those things relate to a fragile natural world. So that is a rather broad and vague question, but I wonder, um, yeah, if you if you guys could talk about continuity and motherhood and regeneration. I was like, Kais has this. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's really interesting. So the way that I mother and in this life and on this realm, um, I think, you know, just growing up, it was a given, right? Like you'll, you'll get married, you'll have children, you'll have a family of your own. I, I have four brothers. They all have kids, um, lots of cousins, um, like lots of procreation <laughs> around me. And, um, and, um, I'm, I'm a stepmother. That's my, um, and so what does it mean to mother children that you, you haven't birthed, right? And I've known them since they were six and three, um, and now they're 19 and 16, soon to be 17. So um, we've been in each other's lives a, a long time, and they know more of their life with me than they do without me. Um, so it's, um, I've thought a lot about, like, the ways that I mother and, um, and how my body mothers, even though it's, it's different than what I assumed it would be when I was growing up. Um, so I think a little bit of that made it into this, into this book, but there's more of it in uh, the poems I'm writing now and in other things I've worked on. Like I have a short play about, um, about being a stepmom, And, um, the first line is like, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a stepmom. said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and so some of my journey and, and it's kind of paralleled my poetic journey too, has been about, um, you know, I'm, I'll be 50 on my next birthday. And so probably like 11 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, thinking a lot about like, is this the way that I will mother in this life? Like, will I, you know, do I want children and actually really calling the question of, um, what it what that means and what, what I wanted to mother and what I had energy for. And I realized, um, wow, this is actually, this isn't the thing that I would have written for myself. It's not the thing that I assumed would happen. It's not that what I would have chosen. And, um, it's exactly how I'm meant to, to show up in this role in, in this life. Um, yeah. And, and also, you know, what, what I'm mothering on the page. Um, Sandra Cisneros talks a lot about that, of just mothering her, her books. And um, yeah. that feels, I don't know if that answers the question, but no, I, I thought about beautiful. mothering in that way. Yeah. 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 I guess I was thinking too about, 
you know, I've often found myself thinking like, I want a more feminized world. And I particularly have this feeling in terms of ecological disaster. And I certainly don't want to stray into <laughs> gender essentialism or indeed misandry, but I feel in both of your work, there is this, this sense that uh, to, to be a mother in, in any sense or to have the capacity for mothering is related to a kind of attunement to the natural world and a, a desire to preserve and nurture and um, foster regeneration. So, um, and, and of course, you know, then that we say mother earth, the natural world has this capacity to remake itself, but we are, you know, we're being terrible children to this mother of us. <laughs> we in the broader sense, of course. Um, um, uh, so, I, I suppose that relates to the, these two kinds of loss that I see in your work. And one is the, the natural cycles of loss inherent in nature, the turning of the seasons, things die back so they can grow again. Michelle, I think of your line, everything breaks to become what it is. Um, I'm in the midst of a really glorious fall here. And you know, I'm reminded these leaves are dying and that's necessary and correct and good. But then of course there is also this loss, um, this the tragic nature of you know, life in the Anthropocene and the irredeemable loss we're inflicting upon our natural world. Um, can, you, can you two talk about that distinction in your work, how those two, those parallel losses might be in conversation in your poems? Kai, so over to you. <laughs> I feel you have something great to the say. Parallel losses of what's natural and what's unnatural. Exactly, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I just wanna bring in the thread of the mothering. I think anyone with young people in their life in whatever capacity are also, you know, I'm watching my children come of age, they're teens and tweens now into a world that I feel really, um, I'm going through my personal grief with, and they're growing up and yeah, it's like, what is natural anymore? And, and then there's the inner growth of the human being, like becoming, you know, an adult, like how is that done in our world anymore? Um, I don't know Hermione, but I do take consolation in our, what our known world and our known cycles in allowing myself to trust the larger cycle that is at work mm -hmm. here. And whatever extraordinary and unfathomable wisdom this earth contains, I choose to put my trust in that, even though it means losing what I know and what I love, which I think is kind of what this book is reckoning with. Like mm -hmm. I'm grieving a mountain and a forest, but I'm also grieving for myself because who I am is, is in relationship to that. Everything I know of myself is in relationship to the land. And so watching that be dismantled or burned down or you know, become utterly different in the span of my lifetime is a larger grief. Yeah. And I have to move beyond myself, I guess, to something bigger, just as we're dealing with a bigger problem, this natural, it's not natural, it's a man-made disaster. But I, I, yeah, that's, I guess, why I lean into art and why I lean back into the land and I get mothered in return. And thinking of what does poetry have to do with helping the situation? It takes me out of the smallness of my fear and my anxiety and into the enormity of imagination and mm -hmm. potential beyond what I can think of rationally um and so just tuning in again and tapping into that is a necessity mm -hmm. and i also believe that in dedicating our creative lives and output to the land it's that i always say this is my offering back and i know it's um you know it's intangible it's not a real solution but my poetry is a product of the land where i live and so i want to always dedicate it um, and thanks back. Mm. Michelle, is that true for you too? Do you feel that 
it is vital for you as a poet to be rooted in this particular place. Yes. <laughs> like I, <laughs> <In a word. laughs> you know, um, I don't know what, so we have a dog who's like, I was speaking of nature. Our dog wants to go out. So I'm hoping someone in my family is uh, helping her with that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I can't imagine I can't imagine living here and not writing poetry or not painting. I, I can't imagine being in this place with um, all the stories that it holds and just, um, and not, um, and not having some kind of um, practice, it's not having, not having some kind of creative practice, whatever it is, whether it's like singing or, or pottery or, or poetry, cause it just, um, I kind of need that to, um, it, it is, it is that thing you described Christ, Christ of like, this is, it's my offering back. Yeah. Just this thing that I can hold in my hands and say, like, I can't, um, you know, I'm, I'm not the Paris climate accords. I'm not the president of the U S I'm not, um, I'm not a biologist and like, here's, here's something that I can, that I can give back and, um, and just ask other people to say, just pay attention. Yeah. Just pay attention. attention. Let's care about this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kais, you have a line in Paper Trail, strange how hard it is to speak to the future. And for both of you, I have a sense of um, inheritance and legacy and speaking to sort of the past and ancestors through the land. Um, but I wonder if for both of you, for reasons we've just been touching on in terms of, you know, this, this fraught, bruised planet, whether speaking to the future is, is harder. <laughs> and yeah, we could perhaps just talk a little about why that is so hard. And Kais, you already mentioned that in terms of the young people in your life. But... I would say that that's also the thing that snapped me out of despair. Like I do not have time for despair. Yeah. or hopelessness because there is a future and there are future generations. And um, whether they're my direct descendants or our collective descendants, I want them to be able to make art. I want them to be able to be in relationship to their home and in love with it. And I have no doubt that they will be, whatever that landscape is. Yeah. Um, so I want to feed them now as I feel fed by my own ancestors. And I want my work to also be an offering to them, a prayer for them. Mm. And it is hard to explain ourselves to them. And it is hard to uh, justify the world that they're gonna get and that we're creating. So that's the difficulty, but on a deeper level, um, it's our responsibility, each one of us to find a way of speaking to them what through however whatever deed our life um, offers us yeah thank you well listen i think it is time we open this up to our invisible uh audience members for whom we're grateful even if we can't see you we believe in your existence um so we already have a few questions but please do keep them coming and we'll try and and get to as many as possible um so our first question is from peggy thank you peggy um, she asks, where would you like to travel to and experience in order to inspire your future pieces? So I guess that is to both of you. Um, I, it's funny, no place too exotic, but my, um, I, I wanna go to, I'm really interested in like Peralta Tome, um, just south of Albuquerque. Um, my, my mother's family and, and my memoir is really much more about my, my mom's family, just like big personalities, um, so many stories that um, they kind of filled up this book. And then um, my dad's side of the family is actually, you know, our last name's Otero. And that was the a former territorial governor of New Mexico was an Otero. Like the, the family has been in the state a really long time. Um, so I'm really interested in just knowing more about um, this place that we came from. So we, you know, we were, we had a lot of sheep apparently. <laughs> so, and that was in that area of New Mexico, these tiny towns. And um, so I'm just interested in kind of being there and um, 
walking the land. I get a lot out of like walking places, even if I, I'm not a linear researcher at all, but it's just, what does this place feel like? Um, what, what's the view from Tome Hill? Um, there's a pilgrimage every there, you're there every year for Good Friday. Um, so yeah, so not really, you know, maybe an hour south of here. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 <laughs> Kais, how about you? I have always been so universe in a grain of sand. Like we go to Colorado as our big exciting and New Mexico, but I think COVID has changed me. And if I could travel, I would follow, I would trace my origins. I would go to the places of my ancestors. I would go to that apple orchard. This, it's not an orchard, the forests in Almaty. I would go to Russia. I would go to the like boreal forests and witness them in the Arctic and see what was gonna be lost. Yeah. yeah. This question uh, is, I guess, sort of related. Well, in some ways. Uh, this is uh, from Sue and Sue asks, how does living in a border state impact your work? Um, Michelle, I know you have a, a wonderful poem. I, I might get the title slightly wrong, but something about borders not being a metaphor or correct me, please forgive me yeah, for the, your yeah. title. Where the border is not a metaphor. And it was inspired by um, it being on a panel with a group of writers. And I was the only one who lived in a border state and had grown up on the US-Mexico border. And one of the poets on the panel talked about, like, I think it's just all in our imagination and there's a borderless realm and, um, and, and yes, I agree with that. My imagination is borderless and there is this really ugly wall that separates um, the, the place where I grew up from the place that's just on the other side that used to be kind of free flowing and to see it now. Um, and this is a tiny port of entry. So I grew up in Deming, 30 miles north of the US-Mexico border. And the town right on the border is Columbus and its sister town is Palomas. And that used to be, um, you could just walk across. You didn't need, um, when I was growing up, um, you know, our marching band went and played there. We would go to the dentist. Um, that's it was different countries, but it just felt kind of arbitrary. Like, how did we end up on this side and other folks ended up on the other side? And um, to see it now is, um, you know, it was a major port of entry. There's, um, it's highly militarized. And, and I think that's another, I think about what something like that does to landscape or does for bobcats or does not to mention humans. Um, and um, so it, it definitely, um, I don't think it's as much in this collection, but my whole memoir is, is about borders, right? So it's both about that, that line, that borderline, um, you know, Southern New Mexico, um, Chihuahua, the state of Chihuahua, and then also El Paso Juarez and um, how you have one of the safest cities in the world um, pressed right up against one of the most dangerous cities in the world, especially for women. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, that paradox I'm really interested in those things and then these metaphorical borders of like between life and death and sanity and madness and safety and danger um and how a place like El Paso Juarez really holds all of that um mm. you know, that's how it works its way and it, it shows up a lot in my work yeah yeah guys how about you mm. I mean, I just want to just honor Michelle's words because they really resonate. And I know like her growing up where she did and that's the border sure. story. And yeah. Yeah. for me, it exists in other ways. And in my work, I'm actually a nurse. So it's the borders are, they're here. They're in our, you know, I, I, I guess I feel as far from it as someone in Boulder in some ways, except for the ways in which the our lives are actually not separated. There is yeah. no border. Yeah, right, right. Um, another question, this is from Brianna. Brianna asks, do either both of you look at an element of nature, the light, the trees, the river, as a main character in your collections? Michelle writes a lot about water and the forest. Is there a narrative arc to this element? Um, I would say, Kais, you write a lot about trees too, but um, yeah, how do you guys respond to, to that question from Brianna? 
I would say the river, my dry, beloved Santa Fe River is a absolute main character. Um, and alter ego and many different things. And that the trees, whether it's the orchards, the apple trees, the forests, um, or the family tree is another mm. just all consuming image and metaphor for me. Yeah. Michelle? Um, water, definitely. <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, water shows up so much. So I grew up um, along a dry river. I um, the Membrus River. And I remember any time that it would rain enough, we would drive to the river, like maybe there's water in it. And it was always very exciting <laughs> if there was. And now um, the, the river that it, the river that I'm closest to both, like, I think spiritually and, um, and geographically is the Rio Grande. And to think about like all the places that that connects and just the places in my, along my own family line. Um, mm. So, yeah, so there's definitely that I think water and, and lack of water and thirst um, mm. will always make its way into my work. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're making me thirsty. Just <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. um, well, we are, we're hastening closer um, to the end, alas. Um, here's a wonderful question. Uh, I'd love to put to you both an anonymous question. Um, both of you have observations of the natural world woven into your poetry. Is there a particular season that is the most inspiring to you? Yeah, we're in it, this one. We're in it. <laughs> I was just gonna say this one. Tell me why. <laughs> um, I think it's that thing of like, there's, um, so I, I'm, I'm overlooking, we have this courtyard, right? And it was, um, it's its own little ecosystem, its own little microclimate. And it really um, it saved me in the pandemic. Like everything felt so small that there was so much beauty here. And this was the time of year where like the, the autumn set um, you could just see it turning from green to like, now it's this really beautiful burgundy color. Uh, we've got some tomatoes that are just hanging on. Um, there's a volunteer cottonwood that we're going to have to move because <laughs> like, it can't be in our courtyard. Um, and I, I just think of how it's holding, um, it's holding so much life and so much death. And I know that in just a few months, it's, this is going to look completely different. And it, it makes me sad to think about it. Um, yeah. And, and I think that um, it, it's just it's the season where things are really close to the bone, right? Like there's so much beauty and everything is, it has to die. It has to break to become, um, and it'll come back. It's feeding the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. How about Beautiful. you? Beautiful. All that. And the quality of light. Yeah. Um, you have a line of the landscape. Line New Mexico is the chamisa, the golden chamisa, the golden cottonwoods. I just soak it in and that preparation for entering the darkness, which is a close second for favorite times of year. The, the internal reflective um, root strengthening season. Um, I just am enjoying the preparations for that. And again, we're learning each, each fall how to do this how to live, how to grieve, how to mourn, and how to die, ultimately. That's that's such a hopeful note to end on, weirdly. <laughs> Kais, I feel like you've just, no, it is. I feel like you've just reconfigured winter for me with the phrase root strengthening. I can be like, that's what I'm doing. I'm root strengthening. <laughs> yeah, you are. Um, Thank you both so much. It's just so wonderful to hear from you. I just want to um, encourage everyone listening, everyone who's tuned in to go buy these wonderful books. Um, you can do that at www.oldfirehousebooks.com. Um, I also just want to invite everyone to take the event survey, um, which is at focobookfest.org. That's F-O-C-O bookfest.org. Um, and you can fill that in online. Um, and your feedback really helps the library continue to provide excellent literary programs. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Kais. Thank you, Michelle. It was a real joy to talk to you both. And it's lovely that we are closing out the festival with you guys and um, your poems of loss as well as consolation. 
So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful conversation to you both. Yeah, thank you both.